Hey guys, thanks for clicking through to episode two of Chasing Games Radio. We've got an amazing guest today, Lane Norton, Dr. Lane Norton Paul. Um, we're going to be talking about correlation versus causation, tips of uh, productivity that Lane gives, uh, tips for becoming an online coach as well that he has, uh, and how to uh, set up your day correctly in the right mindset to be able to uh, have a produ productive day as well. Our uh, cheat meals okay. We're going to be going through a couple of uh, listener questions that you guys have submitted. And also uh, some of the struggles that people have post comp as well. So how to overcome those when people really smash it and really push hard to be able to get the best results for their competition. How to go, how to deal with that, and when people are travelling as well post comp as well. So I've got that. And the biggest news is some epic news that uh, Lane kind of gives for all Australians uh, in regards to him. So be sure to check out the entire uh, podcast, whether it's on YouTube or SoundCloud. Share and like it to help spread the Chasing Games movement. Thanks for watching, guys. Chasing Games Radio. The insatiable quest for constant progression. Chasing is the act of pursuing. Gains is the result or positive outcome. Chasing Games Radio. Here's your host, Cody McAuliffe. Hey guys, welcome to episode two of Chasing Games Radio. We've got uh, an amazing guest here today. We've got um, someone who's a PhD in nutritional science with a speci specialization in skeletal muscle protein metabolism. So he's also got a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. He's an IFPA, Natural Pro Bodybuilder, NGA, Pro Bodybuilder. We could go on forever with all this stuff. Uh, raw Elite Pro Powerlifter. He can squat 303 uh, kilograms at uh, 93 kilograms, which is a world record lift. He's uh, one of the key bloggers on bodybuilding.com and has over 5 million YouTube views. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Lane Norton. Thanks for coming on the show, Lane. Hey, Cody. Thanks for having me, bud. I appreciate it. Awesome. Uh, so I've just got a couple of questions that we'll go through uh, to start off with. I see you've uh, just had a video log that's come out in the last couple of days on the whole processed meat uh, debacle that's going yeah. on at the moment. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a little about bit about the? Um... Yeah, sure. The so the the report came out from the World Health Organization, basically putting meat, processed meat, in the same category as cigarettes in terms of carcinogens. Yeah. And. Um, I saw that, you know, and of course, hysteria followed, you know, people cutting out meat and all those sorts of things. And I, I, you know, I went through and it started, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people did it too. So I definitely wasn't the only one, Yeah. Uh, but kind of combed through the data to figure out, you know, first off, what you need to understand is all the research they looked at is correlation research, which is fine. Correlations are fine to help pick out trends, but they don't tell you about cause and effect. Yeah, for sure. And... You know, just a basic correlation that you can do is it, it, ice cream ice cream cells are highly associated with murder, yeah. like rates of murder. Do we think that ice cream is causing murder, you know, <laughs> or that murder, or that murder is causing ice cream? You yeah. know, like the, 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 there's that possibility as well. So maybe people murder somebody and they get really uh, hankering for ice cream. I don't know. Yeah, you know. Um, so, but. What you need to do is you need to have mechanistic data that also supports that. And there really isn't a whole lot of mechanistic data to support um, what they're saying. Uh, and, and I think we need, to, we need to also point out exactly what the risk is that we're talking about. Because to put it in the same category as cigarettes, if you smoke, it increases your risk of developing cancer by 2,500%. Yep. Okay, so it's an enormous increase. The, the relative risk. If you increase, if you have high meat consumption, it increases your risk of cancer by 20%. Yeah. Okay. So let's actually break down what that means. Because um, 20% sounds like a lot. That, that scares people. Yeah. Sure. Um, that's basically going. So if you do, you have a, a rate, like low level meat eaters have a 5.6% chance of developing colon cancer. If you eat high levels of meat, it jumps up to 6.6%. Okay, that's a that's a one percent increase. Yeah, a one percent absolute increase. Further, 
the way they determine this stuff is they use dietary recall questionnaires, which are uh, they're they're extremely just bad at being accurate. They're usually just not that accurate at all. Yeah. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to use a really inaccurate way of assessing uh, nutrition analysis and pick out a really small difference in relative risk. And that's just a correlation. So just that's a really – to make that leap that they made, uh, I think it's a little bit irresponsible. Uh, yep. And again, I think it's okay to say, hey, meat eaters have an 18% greater incidence of cancer. That's fine. That's true. That's statistics. Okay. Yep. Cool. But, you know, to – it's also the way they word it. If you eat meat, you have eight, you're eighteen percent more likely to get cancer. No, you're not. That's not what that data says. What it says is that meat eaters have an eighteen percent greater likelihood that they have cancer. Okay, so it's not like every time you eat a piece of meat, your your risk of cancer just goes up. You know, by eighteen percent. That's not how it works. Yeah. Um, and also, there's confounding variables. People who eat meat also tend to be more likely to smoke. They're sure. more likely to not exercise. Yep. They're more likely to eat less fruits and vegetables. They just have an unhealthier lifestyle overall. Yeah. Right? But there's a big difference between a guy who chows down three Big Macs a day at McDonald's and somebody who's exercising, eating a high-protein diet, and controlling their calories. That is an enormous difference, and that has not been assessed by anyone. So I think those are just all important points to keep in mind. Yeah, for sure. So it's kind of similar to the whole thing that came out maybe like a year ago or something about high protein diets causing cancer as well. Yeah, well, actually, that was even worse because that was so. If you looked at, they took a subsection of a subsection of data and emphasized that. If you actually look at their statistics, what you found was that people who ate a high protein diet actually had a lower all cause mortality rate. Okay, so they actually live longer. <laughs> all right, so isn't that the main headline? Shouldn't that be the main headline? You'd think so. Um, but what they did was they took from people aged this to this, smoking, uh, ri the risk of cancer for people who ate high protein was the same as smoking. Listen, if you, if you torture statistics enough, you can find what you want to find. Yeah. Okay, my advisor calls that torturing the data. So... I think it's important to keep in mind everything in context, all right? You have to – like if we look at older people, you have to die of something. Something <laughs> is going to kill you. That's true. So if you look – everybody talks about now how cancer rates are so high. Well, yeah, that's because we have people who live in the 70 and 80. You know, 500 years ago, people didn't live that long for the most part. Yeah. And so they died of you know viruses, infections, uh, war, famine. Right? They think cancer is a rich people disease. You know what I'm huh. saying? Like that's a yeah. rich people disease. Now, not always people get cancer young, but um, you've got to die of something. So, I think looking at all cause mortality is probably a more telling statistic. Um, and again, that's only associate. You know, that's only an association study. So, who knows? Um, it's hard to just say. You know, I'm also not ready to take that study and say, "Hey, look, protein will increase your lifespan." I I'm not ready to say that at all. Yeah. True. Okay, cool. Uh, so you've actually started a foundation. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I um, we have the, the BioLane Foundation. It was actually – I really can't take that much credit for it. Um, my she hates it when I give her credit, but my client, Maggie Kuhn, um, she's very philanthropic. And uh, I worked with her for a, 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 a while. Um and she was so happy with how, you know, she had come from a really bad coaching background. Um, somebody had really, really kind of, you know, not done a good job for her. Let's just put it nicely. And she said, uh, you know, she's like, you were so good for me. How do I, you know, how can I give back to help, you know, get other, you know, really intelligent people in fitness? And I said, well, I think, you know, education is the most important thing. So we decided to start the BioLane Foundation. Awesome. And she funded it with a lot of her money, and I put in some of mine as well. And, um, you know, now we're taking donations and everything. But we're looking for, you know, we're not curing cancer or anything like that. But what we're looking for is to fund research that directly benefits the fitness industry. Yeah. So we funded two 
uh, studies so far with grants. And, um, you know, the first one was by uh, uh, a guy at University of North Carolina. His name's Eric Trexler, and he works in the lab of Dr. Abby Smith Ryan. And they were looking at, they went around to different bodybuilding shows and they collected uh, a lot of data about competitors. And it's not really an intervention study, but they just want to look at, you know, what are the characteristics of competitors before shows, after shows, like how much, how lean are they, how much fat do they regain, what are their eating habits. All that. So trying to figure out some trends so that we can look for where we want to take the research. Yeah. And then uh, there's an, uh, another uh, grant was given to a student for uh, Dr. Jeremy Linicky, and they're going to look at some stuff with regards to blood flow restriction training. They're going to look at whether or not, um, you know, if you add – blood flow restriction on top of regular training doesn't make a difference because right now they've only compared, compared you know, blood flow restriction to nothing or blood flow restriction to regular training. So they're going to look at adding blood flow restriction to regular training, see if there's any extra benefit. Yeah. And uh, finally, we, we uh, put a grant to uh, the lab of Dr. Bill Campbell. Uh, the student who applied was uh, Lauren Conlin. And uh, so Lauren wanted to look at a uh, flexible dieting model versus restrictive dieting and see if there was any differences in fat loss. So basically telling people, hey, you have to eat these specific foods uh, versus just saying, hey, you hit these macros, yeah. you know, eating kind of what you like. And we're going to see if there's any difference in fat loss. Um, and then also um, she's going to follow up after they're done, you know, once after they're done and see if there's any difference in, in body fat regain as well. So some pretty cool stuff. And I think, you know, obviously we want this to continue and, and uh, continue to improve things and, and get us more research out there. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely what we want. Um, has Eric's um, data been published yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, we're, we're actually in the process of getting some updates from all our all of our um, all of our grantees, I guess you would call them. Cool. And uh, so we'll get more, but. It'll probably be a few years before it gets published just because that's how long publications take. It's just an enormously slow process. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so anyone who doesn't actually know what blood flow restriction training is, probably just Google your name and blood flow restriction and they'll be able to find everything they need. Yeah, if you Google blood flow restriction training, you'll, you'll have a lot of stuff come up for sure. And uh, you can Google it with my name or, or Jeremy's name and uh, you'll have a, a ton of stuff that will that'll come up. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so... In regards to research papers, what's the probably the most influential, the best one you've read in the last month? Oh, well, oh man, um, nothing really jumps out to me in the last month, but probably the one over the last couple of years that I read that I thought was just phenomenal was um, uh, by a guy named Daniel McLean. That was, uh, it was he's from the University of Denver, and it was called. Uh, Biology's response to dieting, the impetus for weight regain, and just talked about all the mechanisms by which, you know, your body tries to maintain homeostasis and why people are so, people can lose weight, but they have a really, really hard time keeping it off. And, it, you know, it was just an amazing paper. And I don't, I don't think I've ever read a review that was that thorough and that good. It was just, it was awesome. Yeah, cool. I've heard you talk about that one before, so that's great. Um. Uh, I've got a question here from one of my listeners. What are the three biggest uh, educational influences uh, to get you uh, where you are today? Uh, so I think uh, I'm going to shout out some, some teachers, some professors. So for, the first one is definitely my PhD advisor, Dr. Don Lehman, who just taught me how to – not only taught me so much like about science, but just taught me how to be a, a good scientist, you know, um, we have a lot of scientists out there that aren't doing good science, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so he really taught me how to think critically, you know, um, to not be afraid to think outside the box. And, and, and that's and like, honestly, I, I could go on for an hour just about how great he was. And, um, you know, looking, looking, I have the benefit of hindsight now, but looking back, I really didn't appreciate at the time how phenomenal of an advisor he was. And he, yeah. he's the best. You know, he was awesome. Uh, he's retired now, so unfortunately nobody else <laughs> will get that opportunity. But um, then uh, uh, a couple of professors I had in undergrad school, like I, I really, uh, I went to a place called Eckerd College, which is a small private school. Yeah. And I really felt like I got a fantastic education there. 
Um, I had some professors, Dr. David Grove, uh, Dr. Uh, Wayne Guida, and uh, Dr. Chris Schnabel, and all of them were in the chemistry department, and they really, they really, not only did they push me, but they made it interesting for me, and and they really like fostered, you know, with uh, Dr. Guida was my biochemistry professor, yeah. and he knew I was interested in bodybuilding, and I would I would you know he knew when I asked the question it was. I was thinking of how can I relate this to bodybuilding, and he never discouraged that. He always indulged me, you know, always listened, and always fostered that interest uh, in the human body. Even though it was bodybuilding, he fostered that interest because he knew that that's what made it interesting to me, and he looked at that as a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and then, <laughs> you know, so those people made a, a, a huge difference for me. And actually, this is going to sound weird, but posting on the message boards – um, helped me a lot in terms of wanting to learn more. You know, you know, I don't do it so much anymore. But you know, for from 2001 to 2012, I posted on those message boards quite a bit. The bodybuilding.com and mindandmuscle.net. Yeah. I, uh, you know, whenever I get in a debate with somebody and they win, I hate it. You know, <laughs> not, not not that they win, not that somebody's right or wrong, but just that I could if I couldn't back up something with data, it really bothered me. Yeah. And so that drove me drove me to really want to understand things more. And uh, so I'd say those were kind of the big three things for me. Okay, cool. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail about like the relationship that you have with bodybuilding.com and how it started and where it's going? Yeah, so actually, um, man, I, uh, I before my first show, which was in 2001, uh, I, I was a teen show. I started, they had a message board and, you know, at that time, bodybuilding, like, if you if there's nobody in your gym that's doing it, you don't really have any community, you yeah, know? Yeah, um, Now we have this huge community, you know, and it's amazing. Like, uh, before it was just like, if you found somebody that was in the bodybuilding, like, you didn't even care, like, if they didn't do what you did, you're just like, oh, my God, have you just become best friends, you know? Like, <laughs> I love uh, that name, yeah. <laughs> so, we, uh, we... I started posting on there, yeah. And I, you know, I kind of got over the course of six months a year. I kind of got known as somebody who knew what they were talking about, and people started suggesting to me to, to try to write for the main site, you know. Yeah. And I was like, oh, they're not going to want, you know, my my stuff. And um, I, I so eventually I just I sent an email to, to the site and I said, Hey, you know, would you be interested in my articles? Here's some samples of my writing. This is my background. I'm doing a BS in biochemistry. I've, I've done a sh I've done a show, I've done it well. And they said, Yeah, we'd love to have you as a writer. You know, this is now if I did it, they'd be like, get lost, kid, you know. Not <laughs> not that not that they're mean or anything, but just they have so many options, you know. Yeah. Um but uh, yeah, so I started writing for them then and you know, did it for years and uh, became a pretty popular writer with them. And then in 2007, I started a video series with them, which is called Inside the Life of a Natural Pro. And then, you know, that that kind of took things to the next level. And, you know, now I have a video trainer with them and we have, you know, we're partners in a supplement company called Carbon. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, things have really kind of, um, it's, it's interesting to see how they've grown, I've grown and, and vice versa. But obviously, you know, um, I do well for myself. But they're a half billion dollar company, so <laughs> they've uh, exceeded all expectations. I would say of what people thought they could be. Yeah, cool. Um, what do you think about uh, the classic physique um, categories that are coming in now, and uh, the I guess the uh, attempt to move kind of away from uh, the like kind of distended gut look from some federations, but not others. Where do you kind of see that heading, and do you think it's uh, something that's going to stay more kind of classic yeah, physique so looks? Or my, my question is, if you want to get rid of the guts, why don't you just not reward that physique? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right, like you don't need to make a new division now. If you want to make a new division, that's fine. Like I got, I have no problem with that. I, I think it's fine, you know. Um, but I think it's just a. I think you're sending a mixed message. You know, it's a little weird if you say, you know, we don't we want to take stuff back to the classic physique. Yeah. Okay, then reward the classic physique, right? Like yeah. that's all you have to do. If there, there's a reason that guys with big guts and you know physiques that don't look aesthetically appealing are doing 
are, are, are getting that way. Yeah. It's because those guys do well. Like they win pro cards, they win bodybuilding shows. Like, so if you stop rewarding that, just by law of survival, less people will be gravitate towards making their physique that way, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think that you know, I, I, and again, I think it's fine. Like I'm a capitalist, so I'm all about like you know choice and, and people being able to do whatever they want. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I do think again that if you want to get rid of that, the the simple, very simple way to do that is just to simply stop rewarding that. And, but it's kind of like it's about ten years ago they told uh, female bodybuilders that we want you twenty percent less muscular. Yeah. And they never enforced that. It was never enforced, and when it was enforced, um, people whined and complained about it. So. Uh, and now look at what's happened to female bodybuilding. It, it basically doesn't exist. Yeah, you know, right. I, I mean, it just doesn't exist. Uh, there's like two shows a year that have it. The Olympia doesn't have it. I don't know if the Arnold has it now. Um, and even in natural bodybuilding, like you know, even though those, they, everybody's just gone to figure. You know, there's just yeah. more opportunities with figure. You know, and again, I, I love female bodybuilding. I think it's great. You know, but it's just not. It's just you know. That is the market, right? So if you – female bodybuilders noticed that figure was being rewarded with more sponsorships, more endorsements, all this kind of stuff. So guess what? Oh, and physique too. So they left bodybuilding, right? Yeah. So that's how you solve that problem. But you know, I don't want men's bodybuilding to get to that point where people are just so like, Ugh, you know, that they, that they just stop caring. Yeah. Fair enough. Um we just got another question by one of the listeners. Joe wants to know when you're going to be competing in natural bodybuilding again next. <laughs> Everybody wants to know that, don't they? Yeah, we all uh, want to know. We're hanging out for uh, it. Yeah, so I honestly don't know. Uh, I'm just having fun doing powerlifting right now. Yeah. Um, you know, bodybuilding, not that powerlifting isn't selfish because it can be selfish, but bodybuilding is really selfish. Yeah, it is. And even if you even if you do, and not even through intending it to be, but even if you do everything right, like you flexible diet, you try to have balance, at a certain point to win bodybuilding shows, you are going to be unbalanced. Like yeah. That's just, that's just how it is. Like to get my PhD, I was unbalanced. I was doing a crap load of work for my PhD, right? Like that's just how it is. Yeah. But I'm not at a point where – like I have a son – I'm gonna. We're gonna start trying to have another kid. You know, like That's good I, news. I, I, I want to be a good dad. You know, I don't. I just at this point in their age, I can't imagine. You know, like yesterday, I took my son out for you know it's low calorie ice cream. It wasn't anything bad. Yeah. But like you know, he's digging into my ice cream, and then he's trying to feed me some of his. You know, all stuff. I would. I would want to be like, oh no, buddy, I, I can't. I can't do that. You yeah. know what I mean, like so. Um, at this point, uh, I'm, I'm not going to return to the bodybuilding stage anytime soon. I think I will at some point. Yeah. I'm just not sure when. And probably, you know, it ends up, I'm probably better at powerlifting than I am at bodybuilding anyway, to be honest uh, with you, so, to yeah. be honest with me. Um, but I'll probably do it again just because I have some stuff. I feel like I have some unfinished business I want to go back and do. Yeah. Um, but my shelf life in bodybuilding will be longer than my shelf life in powerlifting. Like, you know. You see guys in bodybuilding do doing well, you know, well into their forties. Yeah. But powerlifting, you know, that's most guys, you know, top out in their late thirties. So um, you can still lift, you know, really light weights and build muscle, uh, just getting enough volume in. So yeah. I'll probably take powerlifting as far as I can take it. And then when that's done, I'll you know take a few years to you know not compete in a, in anything for a while, get my competitive juices flowing, and then I'm sure to bodybuilding again. Yeah. Cool. Well, what's your short-term goals with powerlifting then? What's the next comp? Yeah, so I'll be doing the Arnold uh, Pro American in uh, in March at the Arnold Classic, cool. and uh, that'll be that that meets invitation only. So that's pretty cool that I got invited for that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll see we'll see how that goes. I, mean, I just I tend to take it like one meet at a time, you know. Yeah. Um, and hopefully I'll qualify for the world team. Um, so I'll. Should find out about that here in the coming months, and if I qualify for the world team, I'll probably do worlds. Yeah, awesome. Um, in regards to your training, how long uh, is probably an average training session for you? It just depends. You know, right now, not having a meet coming right up, I'm just kind of in a you know in maintenance mode and a volume block, and I'm I'm uh, 
uh, I'm probably, you know, two hours or so, but like when it gets to be like overreaching sessions and I'm really, you know, grinding down, I mean, it can be three or four hours yeah. um, and, and, and be pretty brutal. So yeah, I mean, even though it's, you know, there's not the, the strict diet component, there is bodybuilding, there's still a big time investment with powerlifting. Yeah, for sure. How do you, f one of my uh, friends here, he said, uh, how do you fit so much into a day? He uh, He's struggling with um, any time with his business, so he's working as a PT, doing like 50 sessions a week or something, and doing, he competes as well, so he does uh, natural bodybuilding as well, and he just struggles with time, so he's wondering what you do for um, keeping on top of your schedule and getting everything in, because obviously you're achieving so much with launching your new training program, supplement plans, everything, video logs, everything that you do, having a full-time family, massive training load. Uh, how do you fit it all in? Um, yeah, so the first thing to realize is there is no, there is no secret. <laughs> uh, I can't. I can't give you the secret to make more time up here out of nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had to cut things out of my life that just, um, that were things I like to do that I just don't have time for anymore. Like, for example, I loved, you know, uh, every night, usually before bed, I'd play like a half hour to an hour video game, you know, just to kind of, you know, veg out before bed. Yeah, what do you and, like to play? Uh, I don't have time for that anymore. You know, I can't do that. Um, you know, it's just... You're going to have to sacrifice and you're going to have to, to make that time. Now, one thing I will say is if you're training clients in person, you know, that's, you, you, you may want to consider, you know, uh, you know, taking off some of your in-person client load and, and trying to take on more online because that's a little bit more efficient use of, uh, to make money. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like training people in person too, but it's just, you know, that one person occupies all of your time for that block. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so... It's just it really limits your potential in terms of what revenue you can make for that period of time. But, um, you know, I just – I try to keep to a schedule as much as I can in terms of, okay, I get up at this time. You know, even though I don't – I don't um, – you know, I, I don't have a boss or anything. I don't have to be anywhere at any particular time. I still try to keep a schedule because I find my time is just more efficient that way. Yeah, you know? for sure. If I start changing everything, it, it can be it can be tough. And you know, I really I have a separate office. I close off my room. You know, I sit down. I set off blocks of time to do particular tasks, and that seems to help me. You know, like what like I have you know schedule. Okay, I got to do three videos this week. I got to do two interviews. I got to do a podcast. I got to do this. And this is what I want to do. All that stuff. Yeah. Cool. So what? Tips would you give someone who's looking at moving from uh, being a PT to more of an online coach? Then, um, so the first thing I would say is that it's you know it's not you just have to really get good at communication, right? And you also have to understand that you know you can't judge tone over email, yeah. And so really be conservative when you think maybe somebody's mad at you or they didn't get something or something like that. Like be conservative and just ask them. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, so, you know, try to make sure you're always communicating because that's the, the hardest part, right? Um, is the communication aspect of it. But once you get the communication down, it's really not that different than training somebody in person, you know, even, you know, e even with not being able to see somebody in person, you can still get videos and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, cool. Do you think it's really important for people to have, uh, an online presence, like do video logs and stuff like that if they're looking at uh, doing more online coaching or do you think it's going to be more built through referrals? I think most important, you know, there, there's there's nothing that, you can't substitute for word of mouth, yeah. you know, um, but the, 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 the biggest thing is that I think word of mouth is the most important thing, but yeah. You're not going to get your stuff out to new areas of people if you don't put it out for public consumption, yeah. right? So, I think people have always said, "Man, you give out so much free information. Like, aren't you worried that you'll get less clients?" I think if anything, putting out free information's got me more clients. So, yeah. you know, I tell people like, put your your philosophies out there, put your your stuff out there, and 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 that by doing that, also people who would be who would be bad clients otherwise. Like, for example, like if they didn't agree with a lot of your stuff, because I got that at first when I got referrals, I'd get somebody who'd be like, 
what, what do you mean you're telling me I can eat lunch meat and get lean? Like you're – this is garbage, you know? <laughs> it's like, okay. Somebody watches my videos. If you know me at all, you're going to be like, all right. Either I don't agree with that guy's philosophy and I'm not going to hire him or, hey, I really like this, the way this guy thinks. I'm going to hire him. You know, so it kind of, in a way, it acts as almost like a client screening. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. What books would you recommend um, any kind of new gym goers to read to learn more about um, just the basics of training and nutrition? Book-wise, so people are going to be really unimpressed. Uh, textbooks. <laughs> so a basic physiology textbook yeah. and then a basic nutrition textbook and then like the the NSCA, uh, National Strength and Conditioning Association, their textbook, Essentials of Strength and Conditioning. Yeah. It sounds like it sounds not sexy. It sounds – but, you know, people want – people just want to get answers. They don't want to actually learn, yeah. you know. And if you want to – like, for example – you know, I, I do, uh, you know, I understand what daily undulating periodization is, but I wouldn't understand why it works, how to program and all that kind of stuff just by working with somebody who gave me a daily undulating periodization program. Like, I just, it just doesn't work that way. It will, I wouldn't understand it if I hadn't understood the basics of periodization. And the basics of periodization wouldn't make sense if I didn't understand the basics of physiology. So it's like... It's almost like saying, you know, people who just want, hey, Blaine, tell me whose book to read. It's like, well, you're just getting somebody's opinion. You're not actually learning any science, you know? Yeah. So uh, I tell people, like, that'd be like saying, I, I want to be an architect. Uh, just show me how to draw a building. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, I can show you how to do that, right? But then if I ask you to build something different from scratch, you don't know, don't know what to do. Yeah, you know? I'm just going to redraw it. And so yeah. it's the exact same thing. Like you may know what worked for you or you may know how somebody programmed something for you, but then just simply regurgitating that for somebody else, if you don't understand it in context, like it, it, you're going to have very limited success. Yeah. It's like the Instagram effect. Yeah. Um, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> what would you recommend in regards to books into improving your mindset then? Um, you know, I haven't really read a whole lot of like self-help type books, but I do watch a lot of videos. Yeah. Um, so for example, um, like I watch a lot of Les Brown motivational stuff. Yeah. Um, cool. He's great. Les Brown, Eric Thomas, Zig Ziglar, um, all those guys are, are phenomenal. Um, you know, I recommend those sorts of things. I actually like when I get ready in the morning, like when I'm taking a shower, I always start with my day by taking a shower. Yeah. It just, it's like, like symbolically cleansing me. You know, I like to feel clean and then I start my day. <laughs> but I'll put like a motivational, like a five to ten minute motivational speech on while I'm in there because it just sets up my day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it sets me in the right kind of state of mind. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I think that's important. I've actually noticed a difference from doing that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I try and sleep to motivational stuff whenever I can. Hmm. Um, what is your uh, opinion on the terminology between like a cheat meal versus a refeed? Yeah, I don't like using the word cheat because I think like it's kind of pointless and it also um, it, it, I don't like to put ethical constraints on food. <laughs> so food is not an ethical quibble. <laughs> it shouldn't be an ethical uh, debate. Um, so I think you know, when you call something a cheat, it implies, you know, that there should be some kind of guilt associated with that. And there shouldn't be any guilt. Like, plus, people say, well, Lane, do you never have, you know, cheat foods? I'm like, all the foods that you guys consider cheats, I eat. It's just, I do it in moderation, and I factor it into my daily intake. So what's wrong with that? Like, why is, what's wrong with that? So I just, you know, if I can, if I have room to factor that in, uh, you know, I just prefer to do it that way. Okay, cool. Yeah. Definitely agree. How do you uh, deal with clients that uh, have the mindset of just doing everything it'll take uh, to achieve the goal of looking the best on stage or whatever it is, uh, but saying, and then after that I can just do whatever I want? How do you kind of lead them towards more um, or thinking about reverse dieting after that? 
Yeah, so I think what what I've noticed with people over the over time is the people who who push the hardest, who like really really push themselves and calories get really really low, they have the hardest time afterwards. Yeah, um, you know, so trying to you know emphasize to them that the post diet period is still very very important. Um, is 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 difficult to do. Um, you know, I've, I've had this discussion with Lauren, uh, because before, like a few years ago, we didn't have to get quite so aggressive when she was dieting down and her reverse went very smoothly. Yeah. And this year, this year, just for a few different reasons, it's a long explanation, but we really had to, we kind of had to crush her by the end. Yeah. Um, and then the reverse has been much more difficult this time. And so I think when you really, you know, have to perturb the system that hard, it's going to fight back against you even harder. You know, you're going to be hungrier, you have lower energy, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, really um, trying to. So I think the biggest thing is like putting yourself in the right mindset yeah. before you get before you get done, and not just looking at your show as an endpoint, but just as a stop along the way, right? And so. It, you know, it's important to relax the diet without going crazy. And yeah. So that's what I always try to emphasize. And I always try to emphasize to clients like, hey, listen, I, I want to feed you. Yeah. I'm going to let you have all – you're going to get a chance to eat all the foods you want to eat. You don't have to have them all right now. Yeah. Right? Like you're going to have a chance through this entire off season, And that usually like calms people down. But, you know, it, it's tough. It's very tough. And – that being said, I talk to clients. You know, if they say, "Hey, listen, I know that I'm going to gain some body fat, but I'm just tired of feeling like crap. I want to feel better faster. You know, and I'm willing to tolerate some fat gain for that." Yeah. Cool. No problem. It's not my job to judge you if you decide that you're okay with a little more fat gain. Cool. We'll do it. We'll, we'll reverse you faster. You know. But if somebody says, "Hey, I want to gain the absolute minimum amount of body fat," Um, possible, then we got to go slower. Yeah. So with people who uh, plan holidays after their competitions, what do, what do you think is the best uh, tips for them? Is it just to train as hard as possible while they're uh, on holidays? Or Ooh, yeah, uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, so you know you don't want to spend your entire holiday training because yeah. it's not a holiday, you know. But I would say you know don't just take completely off and. Don't just have it where you're bored. You know what I mean? Like where all you're doing is just sitting around the whole time relaxing. I mean, relax, but like do excursions. You know, if you're going to the beach, like go snorkeling or, or something. You know, what I mean? do something where it takes your mind off food because what's going to happen is if you're just sitting around, you're going to be completely preoccupied with food. Yeah, like, and you're not going to enjoy your vacation at all. So just plan activities with your vacation that, you know, basically uh, take your mind off eating. Yeah. What's your favorite high carb meal or training day post meal? Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> uh, oh. Actually, so uh, ice cream is one of my staples, but also I love I love a good uh, buffalo burger and sweet potato fries. That's probably one of my favorite go to meals. Yeah, well, awesome. Now uh, I've got another question here. Oh, sorry. Denver Stone asks if you're on his level now with dips and presses. Apparently, you should know about that. You train together or something. Yeah, Denver is uh, he's a very strong presser. So no, I'm not. I'm not on his level yet. But uh, ask him if he even squats. <laughs> I'll pass it on to him. <laughs> okay. Great. It's funny because he's got bigger legs than me. But yeah, I squat more. So there. <laughs> <laughs> you win on that round then. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So that's almost all of my questions. Uh, probably the net biggest one is uh, when are you going to be coming back to Australia? Yeah. So I'm in the. I'm making myself in trouble by being too honest, but I'm in the process of discussing setting up a, a tour of Australia in, in, in March of next year. Um, um, yeah. And we'd probably hit three spots. We'd probably hit Melbourne, Sydney, and Perth. Okay. Um, Looks like I'm going to fly. What's that? Looks like I got to fly to one of those places then from Brisbane. <laughs> yeah, so like Brisbane, we've always done okay, but it's it's just it's t usually tough for us to sell enough in Brisbane for it to make sense. Yeah, it's, it's it's an okay spot for us, but it's you know it's not like we do it's not like we don't sell any spots. It's just you know we just don't sell as well as those other three. Yeah, for sure. Um, but um, 
I like Brisbane though. Like it's a very pretty city. It's yeah. uh, one of my more favorite cities to go to. Um, but I haven't decided for sure yet just because I, I traveled a ton this past year and I'm pretty burnt out on it. Yeah. Uh, but we are, we are trying to set things up and if we can get the stars to align, then uh, hopefully I'll make it over in 2016. Cool. Is that going to be a uh, full camp or is it just going to be you coming over? Uh, yeah, I'll have, I'll have camps and seminars and whatnot. Okay, great. That's good news. I think that's probably it for today then. Thanks for your time. What's the best um, way for people to get in contact with you or find you on uh, Instagram, Facebook, all those kind of things? Yeah, so uh, biolane.com is my site. Yep. And uh, you can contact me through there. Uh, also, my, my Instagram, Twitter handles are at biolane. Uh, same thing for Periscope. Um, and then my... My Facebook fan page is facebook.com slash Lane Norton. Yeah. And, uh, no, yeah, that's, that's, and then YouTube is youtube.com slash Lane Norton. And then I've got a uh, few updates coming up. Like my website's getting an overhaul. It's oh, very awesome. close to being done. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look sick and it's going to have a members area. Yeah. So for people who are looking for that extra level of knowledge and whatnot, um, we'll have, you know, more art, more articles from really awesome experts uh, videos. I'm going to be doing like live webinars, all that kind of jazz. So it's going to be pretty a uh, pretty cool opportunity for people. Uh, then uh, I'll also have a website coming out called Avatar Nutrition, which is a flexible dieting website. So basically, like for people who can't afford me as a coach, or or you know, if I just can't take you on that sort of thing, this is like a like basically we've we have tried to encompass my coaching style into an automated computer program. And it'll be like ten bucks a month, and it'll be a great value for people who are looking for coaching. It really, we've done a, done a ton of work on it, and um, I'm super happy with it. I, I think it's going to be sick, and I think people are going to love it. So, um, yeah. So those are kind of things coming up, and those are the places to get a hold of me. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> awesome, sweet. Ten bucks a month sounds like a bargain. You'll be able to uh, help a lot of people that way. So that's great. Yeah, it's. It, I think I think people will really really like it, and we've done a ton of ton of work. We've been working on it over a year. Yeah, awesome. Um, so definitely sound like you've been really busy then with getting all the programs and stuff going. So keep up the great work. Thanks, Cody. I appreciate it, bud. And congratulations to you on doing so well on your shows. Awesome. Thanks very much. We'll talk again soon. All right, bud. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Chasing Gains Radio. Be sure to use the Chasing Gains Radio hashtag on all social media. If you have any questions, queries, or comments about the podcast, use this hashtag. Thanks again for listening to Chasing Gains Radio. Be sure to share and like this podcast to help spread the Chasing Gains movement.